So my topic today is, is very important to me. Um, many of you know me from my, from my open source work and my, and my writing. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, I've been, been very excited to, to get involved in a couple of projects in the Apache Software Foundation. And we don't have a lot of Python programmers working in the ASF. And I will say about that, that as open source grows bigger and more popular and even more commingled with commercial interests, that it's very important to have organizations like the ASF to put the community first and to protect, protect the, the intellectual property rights of open source developers. So I'd like to reflect for a moment on, on everything that's happened over the last 10 years. And, and certainly, it goes way, way beyond that. You know, there's work that we are we're depending on in the Python world, which happened a long time before 2007. But it was this month, 10 years ago, when I personally started thinking about thinking about data analysis. And it's been really amazing to see all of the, all of the progress that we've made. And I spent a lot of this, lot of this time um, personally working on the chicken and egg problem of statistical computing and data analysis in, in Python. We didn't call it data science back then. I guess now we can, now we can, call, it, now we can call it data science. But I was really concerned about we had this great programming language with a scientific computing ecosystem that was a really great platform to build on, but it was still hard to do what we now call what we now call data science. One of the biggest trends over, over this time period is the trend from closed source software to open source software. And so many of you may, may be pay, pay, have painful memories of what things used to be like when if you wanted to do statistics or data analysis, usually it meant writing a check because no one ever got fired for buying MATLAB. And you could understand the skepticism in using open source software for these problems. And I remember talking with my bosses at the time about Python, and they would ask, well, who built this software? Can we trust it? And I would say, well, a lot of them are grad students. Um, and they say, well, are they computer science grad students? I say, no, a lot of them are physicists and scientists who are just trying to, who are procrastinating on their PhDs and, and just trying to, uh, um, you know, I think John, you know, uh, or, or John, you know, John Hunter, who, who passed away this August five years ago, um, you know, started Matplotlib because he got frustrated with MATLAB's licensing policy when he was, you know, generating plots on different servers. And there have been many factors that have driven the, the growth and adoption of open source. Um, you know, certainly, the maturity of the, of the libraries has been a big factor. The cloud has been a huge deal, because there are some days where you want to run a job on one machine, sometimes 100 or 1,000. So if you needed to, you know, the, the licensing model for closed source software is not very, very compatible with that. And certainly, open source has driven the democratization of data science. And over, over the years, I've been really humbled to hear from uh, people all over the world, uh, especially in very poor places, who you know, have a copy of my book or, or are learning from the internet and are working really hard to learn these tools so that they can analyze data and use that to improve their lives. The, Jupiter, the growth of the Jupyter community has also been a really amazing thing. I saw the first incarnation of the IPython notebook in summer of 2011, uh, and I was, just, I was just blown away. Now, I used Mathematica and so was familiar with, with, with the notebook concept, but to see that vision realized in such a natural way that fit in with the rest of the Python ecosystem was really, um, you know, was really something. I started showing it to, to everyone everyone around me. Um, and I think that viral quality to, to, the, to the notebook has been a big factor in its success. But I think, I think uh, you know, the, the IPython developers, um, as they collaborated with the Julia community and others, realized that the, the Jupyter problem is much bigger than Python, and that it concerns the general problem of interactive computing and reproducible research. And so it's been you know, just amazing to see this community grow and, and to see so much collaboration across these different programming language ecosystems. But I'd like to think a little bit about the future. And I spent a lot of time thinking and, and worrying about the future, um, mostly because I want it to get here faster. 
because um, we would all we would all like that. And I th I don't know that we would have been able to predict accurately the last 10 years. So who knows where we'll be uh, in 2027? Maybe we'll all be programming in JavaScript. I mean, it's 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 entirely likely. But I think there's there you know there's some things that we can be doing um, you know that we can be doing now to lay the foundation for for a better future. Um, and I'd like to talk about some of those things. So one of the major themes right now, and I expect this to continue for, for many years, is what I call the AI arms race, faster, more scalable, more cost-effective machine learning. So I was in a talk by Michael I. Jordan, a uh, machine learning researcher, and he quipped that AI is really machine learning, which is pattern recognition. And that's definitely true. And you have all of these cutting edge new machine learning technologies being developed. But to use machine learning models, you still need to load and access data and clean and manipulate it, explore it, find features, and then do all of that in a reproducible way so that whenever you, when new data comes in, you can update, you can update your model. So no matter how sophisticated the, the AI algorithms get, we're still going to need all of the tools that we've developed for all of the work that happens before you're fitting your models. The hardware landscape has also changed a great deal and continues to change. Um, so, you know, a decade ago, seven years ago, you know, when I was starting out building Pandas, most computers didn't have that much RAM. We were dealing with maybe two gigabytes or four gigabytes or eight gigabytes. Processors generally had one or two cores. Disks were pretty slow, you know, spinning rust, as, as uh, some people call them. And so we've seen disks get 10 times or more faster. You can buy a desktop processor from AMD with 16 cores. You can get a machine with a terabyte or, or two terabytes of RAM. And so, and the data sizes that we're working with have also increased um, as we are collecting more and more data. But if you look at the tools that, the tools that we are using, um, they have not scaled so gracefully to be able to take advantage of modern hardware, hardware. And to be able to use this hardware to its maximum capacity is going to be a lot harder and require a lot more engineering than it took to build the software that we use today. And so one problem that I think a lot about is the fact that when you go beyond the front end, tools like, tools like Jupyter, and you go down into the Python ecosystem, the R ecosystem, and the other areas where people do data science, there isn't a great deal of collaboration. I would even go so far as to call these communities tribal. You know, I'm a Python person, you know, I'm an R person, and that becomes, that becomes a part of your identity. And it's very rare that you see software being developed that can be used uh, across silos. There's, there's tools for calling Python code from Julia, you can call R from Python. But as a way to build software in general, that's not the, the, predominant, the predominant method. There's many different things that, that are in the silos. So you need to access data. When you access data, you need to put it someplace. So those are your data structures and what I call memory formats, things like data frames. You need compute engines to manipulate those data structures uh, to run, to do exploratory analytics, to engineer features. And then you need analytics toolkits to fit statistical models and machine learning models. And if you look from, from left, let's see, from, from, left, to, from left to right, it, it's, it's a funnel. So if you have a problem earlier on in the process, if you can't read a file, if you can't find the right data manipulation, if you can't compute the right thing, you aren't going to get to the model development stage. You're going to fall off and have a bad time. And so if you just look in the, in the Python ecosystem and, the tw and some of the tools, this is not a comprehensive list, by any means, there's a consistent theme here in that just looking at the Pandas project, that we've had to develop software in many different, many different domains. We've written our own CSV readers and many other data access layers. We have a, a half-baked implementation of an in-memory SQL database. We have developed our own data frame data structures. Um, so that's, you know, that's something I think about, the fact that we own all of the software, we built it all, and it's not accessible if you're not a Python programmer and you don't use, and you don't use Pandas. And so I started thinking more critically about this at, at the end of 2015, and I think my thoughts had gone back a, a pretty long time, 
At the end of 2013, I gave a talk uh, whose subtitle was 10 Things I Hate About Pandas. And people thought that was funny. They were like, you build it, you know, shouldn't you really love it? Um, but uh, I, I knew about all of its flaws, and at the end of, at the end of 20, 2015, we started talking about ways that we can make the project better. And one of the things that's come out of that discussion is the fact that we would like to own less of the infrastructure that enables projects like Pandas to exist. So that's, you know, that all, you know, to think about how much time we've spent writing CSV readers, but we've spent all that time because it is so important. And so my hypothesis is what if we could make the, the silos, quote, smaller and have some kind of software that we share across ecosystems? And it would make it easier in the future to build projects like Pandas, to build projects like dplyr for R. When you think about what are programming languages, programming languages are user interfaces for describing computation. And we choose our programming languages for many reasons. Some of them, it's because the people that we work with use that language. Um, but one of the reasons that Python and R and, and other data science languages have become so successful is because the programming languages are maximized for your productivity so that you can get a lot of work done in a short amount of time. And I use the, the iceberg metaphor in talking about programming languages and data science systems because the, the amount, the portion of the software that you see is a fairly small part of, of the code base. You see the user API um, that the engineers have created, like this is how you interact with this piece of software. But there's a huge body of code that you don't see and that, frankly, you don't want to see. <laughs> there's parts of Pandas that, you know, if we showed, you'd be like, oh my goodness, like, I, I never want to see this again. Um, but this is great because, as engineers, this allows us to hide all of this complexity from you and show you only the parts of the library that you need to get your work done. So, you know, if we look at some R and Python examples, even the code looks very similar. So here we have an R example using dplyr reading a CSV file, and the Python code for that looks almost the same, but it uses a different implementation under the hood. So my hypothesis is what if, and here's the big what if, we could create uh, what I call a shared data science runtime that could be responsible for some of these tasks which are common to all of the, all of the frameworks. Now this might sound like total, total vaporware, so I'm going to give you an idea of what I think uh, needs to go in that shared runtime and how we might go about building it together as a community. So the first part, and here's where we have to take a leap of faith, we have data frames in most languages. Python has a pandas data frame, R has a data frame. We call them data frames, but in reality, our data frames are very different when you look inside. So that's a problem, because when I write an algorithm that manipulates a pandas data frame, that's not some th code that you can take and use to process the data that is inside an R data frame, and, and vice versa. So if we want to build algorithms that can be shared between environments, we have to have a data frame in memory format which is portable across environments. A second part of the problem is that we need to be able to share data between environments without incurring any overhead. So if you have a data frame in Python and then you want to run some R code on it, if you have to pay this huge cost to move that data from Python to R, you might be incentivized not to do it at all and just figure out a way to do it in Python. So if we could make these transitions between ecosystems, including, uh, including things happening in the Java world, um, that would be really powerful and would help make our tools a lot more composable. Third part of the problem is it's not enough to have a portable data frame. We need to be able to get data into it. So we need to create optimized data connectors to all of the formats that we use in practice. So this would be really great because me as a pandas user, this means that I could stop maintaining a lot of pandas.read CSV. If you're an R user, the code that implements R read CSV could also, um, be, the burden of developing that could be shifted to a much larger group uh, of developers. A last part of this, and maybe the hardest, um, hardest part, is building a computation engine that is able to compute things, to, to perform computations natively 
on portable data frames. And this is a big topic, and I could give a whole hour-long or three-hour-long discourse on all of my ideas about um, what we could build in this type of engine. But the key things are that you need to be able to embed it in existing systems, so it needs to be embeddable in an R application, embeddable in a Julia application or a Python application. You need to be able to extend it with functions which are written in the host language. So if you write a new function to extend the computation engine in Python, that it can exist as a first-class citizen, and you don't pay a performance penalty when you evaluate that code. And if you look at systems like Apache Spark, which have Python and R APIs, this has been one of the largest pain points that when you want to extend Spark with user-defined functions, you pay, uh, pay a heavy penalty. You also, another an, a slightly esoteric point, is that if you describe a sequence of, of operations using this library, you would like to create a represent, representation of that computation that could be carried over to another environment and evaluated in a portable way. So a couple of years ago, um, I started thinking, um, you know, I can't do this alone. And I tried to find a group of people who were like-minded and wanted to work on this problem together. We decided to create a project in the Apache Software Foundation, um, which we are calling Arrow. And it doesn't solve all four of these problems, but we've been most focused on building portable data frames and zero-copy interchange between environments. And so this is what I've been spending a lot of the last um, two years working on. So if you see me being very busy on GitHub, uh, a lot of it is building, is building the Arrow format, because that means I can build algorithms against a, a data frame that is the same across, across languages. And so in thinking about how we are, are approaching the, the Arrow problem, we need our data frame to be a superset of the things that you can do in, in R, in Pandas, um, but also SQL engines, in particular columnar SQL engines. It needs to be optimized for processing, um, processing performance so that it's efficient on CPUs. And we're also seeing Arrow used on GPUs and other hardware as well. And another part of the problem is that it needs to be done in a way where the project is owned by the community and not by an individual or a corporation. And so we've done it as an Apache project so that our development process is open tr and transparent and that the Arrow project is owned by you, the community. So many of you might have seen that, that Hadley Wickham and I got together at the beginning of uh, last year. I told him about Arrow, and one of the first things that we did is we said, let's pare down Arrow to just the bare essentials for Python and R and make a file format that's interoperable between R and Python. And so we're really excited to, you know, to ship that and to socialize the idea of interoperable data and being able to transition efficiently between environments. So I'm happy to report that there have been, um, there's been quite a bit of adoption of Arrow amongst a variety of open source projects, which I'll allow you to uh, explore on your own um, as I'm running out of time. But uh, this is a big problem, but seeing what we've accomplished in the last uh, 10 years, I believe this is something that we can all um, build together, and the more we collaborate, the faster we can bring about this future. And as I like to say, when you have a chicken and egg problem, sometimes the best thing you can do is be the chicken. So please, be, be the chicken. Thank you.